And welcome to the Saturday morning wake-up call right here on KFAR. This is local talk radio. In the next hour, we're going to be talking about liberty. We're going to be talking about what does freedom mean? Are you free if you cannot do what you want to do? Just a question for you there this morning. I'm Steve Floyd, the monkey behind the machine, making sure that the phone calls get answered and that the microphones are on. Let's go ahead and test the microphones. Good morning, Josh Bennett. Good morning, Steve. Uh, Josh, of course, uh, one of the owners over there at Bighorn Enterprises, helped make our Saturday morning programming possible. The other sponsor of the show is Far North Tactical, over there at the corner of 8th and Lacey. Very easy to find if you know where you're going. It is uh, the old Blondie's building right downtown. If you take airport to Cushman and then turn toward the river and then at uh, 8th, go ahead and turn right until you get on down to that log cabin there at the corner of 8th and the Lacey and you will find Far North Tactical. You can get everything you need from firearms to body armor to survival food. And the whole point is if you'd like to take over a small country, you can do so. Actually, that's not the point. The point is to defend yourself and your family and to do so in against whatever threat you believe is coming. I mean, you're going to prepare differently, Josh, aren't you, if you think the worst threat that's going to happen is if we have a big earthquake and you're going to have to go a couple of days without your McDonald's. Yeah. Then if you think that <laughs> the possibility is that our money is going to be literally worthless and people are not going to be able to exchange or do anything except in the barter system. And if you think that's coming, you're going to prepare a little bit differently for protecting your family than if you just think you have to go to a couple of days without McDonald's. Anyway, that being said, check out Far North Tactical downtown, 8th and Lacey. I wouldn't suggest stockpiling uh, double cheeseburgers either. You know what? I, I, if they're McDonald's cheeseburgers, they will last. <laughs> yeah, they <laughs> and, and, and will. No, no preservation or refrigeration necessary there. They taste the same. Well, hopefully Aaron is tactically making his way here. If he's out there, please come in to your show. And of course, if he is outside right now, he's going to find the door locked and both of us upstairs. So hopefully he has a cell phone and he can text us to let us know that he's here and ready to be let into the tower, as the, so to speak. I, you know, I may I just make mention of something that I, uh, I find kind of peculiar, and then I'll get your your point of view on it and maybe open up the phone lines too. Uh, but then we can go in whatever direction you want to today. Uh, North Korea. I, I don't I don't think people really fully adequately consider what kind of a threat they are, not just to the country in general, but to Alaska. Uh, the latest estimations I saw is that the ballistic missiles that they had could reach Alaska, uh, and, it's, and that's from being fired from their mainland. If they were loaded up on a nuclear sub, they could be, obviously, they could be parked off the coast of Los Angeles, or they could be used to wipe out a large city, you know, and... If they can reach Anchorage um, and decide to do so just because it's the the closest city that they can reach, I, I've heard people say, well, why would they do that? Well, why why do madmen kill their own people? Why do madmen strike out? I mean, why did Saddam Hussein go into Kuwait back in 1991? Something to do. Well, I mean, there's that. I mean, there's that whole idea of aggression really doesn't obey the rules of logic either. I, political and, power also mm-hmm. same thing i mean same what do we why do we send troops into lebanon right exactly I mean, uh, there's it, lots of things we say why the, the, the point being is that two weeks ago there was a major concession made by north korea it was it was trumped up by the by the administration and by not not just that but by the un and all of these pundits around the world well what great progress we've made in the, the efforts to get north korea non-nuclear they made concessions. They're going to agree to set aside their nuclear program in exchange for food stuff. And do you remember that? Yeah. And just yes. like two weeks ago, just yes. like two weeks ago, it was all the news about how uh, great they're going to be. Well, I don't know if you saw the headlines yesterday. You get still on the Drudge Report right now. It's been verified by multiple sources that uh, North Korea is going to be launching a ballistic missile sometime in April. Now, they say that the purpose of it is to launch a satellite, but either way, the launching of that ballistic missile is a direct violation of the agreement that they allegedly made to get the food stuff. And I just, you know, I just would like to applaud the administration on all the great progress being made <laughs> with, with North Korea. Uh, I don't know. I mean, what do you think? You've got, you've got a madman living next door who's arming himself. I, I don't believe I necessarily have the right to go into his house and take his guns away because I fear that he might attack me. However, I am definitely going to prepare 
differently than if I would if I, I thought that the worst thing my, my next door neighbor was going to do was to dump his dog poo over my fence. But by, by the way, that's not happened. I just want to say my neighbor, you know, <laughs> I, I, know, I know that hasn't happened. I'm making I'm making a, a point by way of illustration. Um, I don't know. North Korea has been a silly situation for 60 years now. I mean, we should have never went to war there in the first place. We never ended the war, never won the war, been in a continual state of war for 60 years. And they play the game with us, rattle the sabers, give concessions, rattle the sabers, give them food. I don't know. I don't know what the answer is there. Well, I mean, we can't just go nuke them all. I mean, there's a lot of civilian people that live there. You can't just... <laughs> I don't think that would be the answer. They have a lot pointed at South Korea, too. That wouldn't be very good for those folks. I think there's a little bit of mutual destruction going on there that keeps them from I mean, it going would, over it, the edge. It would keep rational people from going over the edge, definitely. And, and obviously, we've already talked about how North Korea is not what we would consider a rational regime, nor, I mean, the whole philosophy that guides their system of government is irrational. The idea that somehow you can step in and tell people what to produce, tell people how productive to be in their daily lives, tell people how many hours to work, tell many, tell people what their wage is going to be and how much money they owe to the government. No, we're supposed to be talking about North Korea. Oh, 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 I am. I am, actually. I mean, it's the, it's the communist system, but it, it, we're seeing it creeping in here, too. I mean, at some point, we have to realize that the the very concept of government either comes down to one of two philosophies. Either you believe that the government is there to tell people what to do, to, quote, govern us, or you believe that the government that is there is there simply to keep us safe so that we can govern ourselves. Yeah, I was, I've been uh, thinking about that very thing the last couple of days. Um, I finished reading Whatever Happened to Justice, and I strongly suggest anyone to read it, everyone to read it. It's uh, very simple, almost too simple, where you start thinking, yeah, I know all this, but his reasoning is really good. And I think everyone that would read it would maybe solidify their beliefs a little bit if they're already leaning this way, and if, at the very least be able to have sound arguments that people understand. Sometimes we get into these philosophical things about liberty, and people go, huh? And uh, Whatever Happened to Justice is a very good book because it makes it real simple to talk to, simply tell people, well, we got Aaron here, simply tell people about the, the concept <coughs> of liberty. And I'll get back to that. All right. Because well, uh, what I, just before I go, what I've been thinking about is Jefferson, who I think was really brilliant. I know he was brilliant. Um, one of the things he asked us was if we're not – but it's supposed that we are not able to govern ourselves and take care of ourselves. How is it that we are able to govern others? So I'll just leave it with that and maybe jump back on that when we get back. Right. But like Tammy Wilson, okay. It's supposed because she goes down, and we're just picking on her for fun, because she's going to Juno, it's supposed that we are not, those people in Juno suppose that we are not able to govern ourselves which means that they singly, individually, aren't able to govern themselves either, but they are able to govern us. How is that possible? Well, and a great example of that, and I'll talk about this while you're going to let your brother into the station here, is what has happened with this self-defense law that's down there. It's being proposed in Juneau. The whole point of it is that right now, the current self-defense law says that you can only defend yourself with deadly force if you have already considered the possibility of retreat that you somehow have a duty to run away if there's a bad guy out there that's threatening you or your family, that your first response is, I have to run away. That's what the current law is. If you have considered the, the, the retreat option and you're like, nope, I can't, I can't retreat, I'm going to defend myself, then using de deadly force in a case of self-defense is perfectly legal and you will not go to jail for it. That being said... If you use self-defense, you are going to go to jail while they try to determine whether or not you had the possibility of retreat first. Right now, the newest bill that they're considering down there in Juneau, because obviously they know better than the rest of us how to govern our lives, is that, well, perhaps you shouldn't have to consider retreat first. 
that if you're in some place where you are legal to be, like on the street or in a store or in a parking lot, that somehow you don't have to run away first. That's what they were considering. Well, they took testimony on it yesterday, and it looks like right now the bill is dead in committee. They decided, you know what? I think you do have the, the right, that, that you do have the duty to retreat first because, you know what? Bad guys could use this as justification to up the ante. And and the gangs, the gang warfare could get absolutely out of control in Anchorage because, well, I mean, a little editorial on the side there. Obviously, the, the gangs, they, they all obey the rest of the laws, right? I mean, they're... I'm just, I I don't know what all you said, but I, I do know what you're talking about with that bill. Um, Silly thing is, this has all been established for over a thousand years in common law. Mm-hmm. It's egression. Egre- you don't once you egress to a certain point on someone, they have the right to defend themselves. But the way the law is currently written, you if you as the one who's going to defend yourself, you have a legal duty to consider whether you can retreat first. Right now, that if you have an opportunity to retreat and you choose not to, you could be prosecuted. Yeah, well, that's just why laws are stupid. Well, yeah, I mean, it really is. Think, think about how stupid that is. I mean, it's already been established. I mean, seriously, in common law, if someone, um, if they raised the gun at you, you had the right to defend yourself by shooting him or attacking him or whatever. It didn't say, well, you must first jump around the building and hide. He has threatened your life. You have the right to defend yourself. It's That's it. It's been settled law, common law which is actually real law. All this other stuff's political power law, which is a bunch of garbage. All they do is uh, try to reinvent the wheel so they can throw us in jail every time we supposedly break their law. And that was the whole point of the testimony yesterday down there in Juneau, was that somehow, you see, if, if we allowed people to defend themselves without considering whether to retreat first, then you know what? We're not going to be able to put people in jail quite as easily because they're going to be able to use that as a defense in court. I think I figured out a law that does make us more free. Oh, no. <laughs> well, no one else will call in and tell us one. No, I'm curious as to know what you think that is, because I, we haven't seen one yet in the last two years. Well, yeah, we have. The Firearms Freedom Act. Oh, I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> um, to get back to that, though, seriously, the, it just proves more of why political law is garbage. You have, let's get back to... Uh, individual governing for himself. So these people down in Juneau are saying that we aren't smart enough to know how to defend ourselves. So they're going to pass a law and tell us how we can or may or may not defend ourselves. Well, if we're not capable of knowing how to defend ourselves and when to, how are they capable of telling us when we are? If they, them as individuals, they as individuals are no better than us as individuals, then how can they collectively, because collectives are always more stupid than the individual. That's a proven fact. <laughs> Every time there's a collective in a group, they dumb down, which is, group think. I mean, just look at any political body. No, don't Congress, even look at politics. Look at no. business. Look at business. It, yeah. It's called groupthink. If you get three individual businessmen together and you start trying to have the three of them work out a business plan, you're going to end up with a pile of dog poo. Yeah, it gets worse. They, they, it's groups dumb down. So as individuals, we don't know how to properly defend ourselves. And obviously that would mean all of us as individuals, which would mean the politicians in Juno don't know how and when to properly defend themselves. But as a group body, they can come together and tell us as a dumbed down body when it should be done. And what a waste of time. Why are we paying them? It goes back to when we were talking to Scott Kawasaki a few weeks back. Just go home. We'll pay you to stay home. (laughs) <laughs> quit going to work and quit working so hard because all you're doing is trying to reinvent with political law what's been established and set in stone in common law over, well, over a thousand years. Now, it doesn't... Uh, right? Come on, Aaron. I, th- there's a, a, I can tell your eyes are burning. <laughs> you're ready to go. There's a quote that I'm thinking of, but I, I, can't, I can't put my finger on it exactly. I think it was Benjamin Franklin who talked about how the only time that we are truly safe in our lands and in our liberties is when the Congress is not in session. Yeah. Does that sound familiar? Yeah, I think it was him. That was uh, Thomas Jefferson said that uh, he, uh, I can't remember exactly what it was. Basically, he did not like an aggressive government, an active government, because an active government does nothing but take away your freedoms. And like I said, it goes back to a group. We have group therapy down there in Juneau. 
deciding what we can or cannot do because we as individuals aren't smart enough to do it for ourselves. They are individuals, so how are they smart enough to tell us? And we know for a fact from listening to them that much of them are retards. They're idiots. They don't know anything about real life. They don't know anything about, okay, they, they're down there making business decisions, right? How business should be conducted in the state of Alaska. How many of them are businessmen? Oh, boy, that'd be just a handful of them. Very few. Yeah. So why do we have people down there that have never been in the private sector business, owned one, or some of them haven't even worked in the private sector, why are they allowed to make judgment calls and laws regulating the business sector? And that same question could be asked not just at the state level, but also at the national level, looking at what is going on right now in terms of the, the, the huge amounts of laws and regulations that are being heaped on the businessman. You will make more money in your life, if that's what you want to do, by going and working for somebody else yeah. than if you were to go into business for yourself. I that's very true. I got an email the other day from OSHA telling me about the the new OSHA regs that are coming out and the additional 650 pages added to the OSHA regulations for 2012. 600 extra pages. 650 extra pages. Because the people weren't safe before OSHA wrote those. Right. Everyone died. Because there were I mean there were so many people dying from those injuries that they are prohibiting the actions that led to them now. That in fact there's not, nobody working. Well, everybody yeah, died. True. Everybody died from their workplace hazards. Last yes, year. they did. Everyone Every did. single person in the United States died. The, the right industrial there. revolution ended because everyone died. Everybody because there was no OSHA. Which, you know, that goes to something that I was thinking about also when I was thinking of, you know, if we're not able to regulate ourselves, how are these other people, individuals, able to do it for us? What about? Um, the theory of uh, ignorance is no excuse for the law. We hear that all the time, mm -hmm. right? You mm -hmm. go to court and you say, well, I didn't know that was going to Well, ignorance is no excuse. That is bunk. They use that on us all the time with hunting. Yes. And, and they change the regulations midstream. Minute by minute. In, in, I mean, just take, for example, the latest uh, antlerless moose hunt. Mm -hmm. You had to call before you went. To see if it was still open. Well, what if they closed it while you were out there? Yes. Ignorance is no excuse. Right. You Which, have you have broken the law. And that actually was the case where ignorance was no excuse for the law, but they weren't talking about it wasn't meant for political law. Because political law is something where a bunch of jackasses get together and pass a bill, and then some other jackasses come in and repeal it, then other jackasses come in and pass it. So how is that law? It's not logical. Logic is law is supposed to be logical. It's supposed to be common. So you can't go in there and make a bunch of people that, as we just said, and it's provable, groups dumbed down, pass a law, and then another group dumbed down can repeal it. As long as that happens, it's not a real law. And as long as they can pass more and more and more and more, I mean, how many times have we heard nationally where they say, well, we don't really know what's in the bill, but once we pass it, we'll figure it out. Well, that's not, how is that law? That can't be law. So ignorance is no excuse of law was set back in the common days of the common law because it was real simple. Ignorance was no excuse because it was common to know that you can't kill someone. You can't steal from someone. Well, and you I, can't I, rape I, someone. I didn't know I couldn't, I couldn't go and take my neighbor's wife. Yes, exactly. I, I saw her there and she was available. I, I did not know I could not take her. It was real simple. It was do everything you say you will do, which is contract law, and don't egress on anyone's person or property, which that's real simple. Everyone knew that. So ignorance of that was no excuse because everyone did. Today's law, there's no way... They can hold that on us because it's not law. Because even the people who pass the law are ignorant of what's in the law. Aaron, what are you going to say? The only reason that Josh thinks like that is because his kids aren't out there doing drugs. <laughs> well, no, they might be. I don't even know where they are right now. No, that's what people have said. They, they, yeah, yeah. I heard somebody a couple of weeks ago say, claim that you would that you didn't know where your kids were. Yeah. Right. That was quite funny. Well, it is. It's very funny. Four five eight talk is the number. Good morning, caller. All right, they didn't hold. I, I found the item on the Drudge Report that I had mentioned. It's actually it's a link to a document from the New Jersey Office of Homeland Security. And it lists some of the latest uh, things that people are going to be looking for 
for suspicious behavior when trying to find terrorists. Yawning and goosebumps <laughs> are, are now two, two more of the suspicious behavior items. So if you're standing in line for the TSA and you yawn... Oh, nervousness. Well, no, I mean, obviously you're bored. You're bored with this whole government thing. You're showing that you're actually... Uh, and then, of course, if you get if you do get nervous, if you have goosebumps, or if it's a little chilly and you have goosebumps, either way, suspicious behavior. You're going down. You should be detained for that. And I'm looking at the you know, the actual document here where they they come from the office or the New Jersey Office of Homeland Security and Preparedness using the FBI's definition of terrorism. Let me read it to you. Terrorism is the unlawful use of force of violence against persons or property to intimidate or coerce the government or civilian population or any segment thereof in the furtherance of political or social objectives. That would include the Iraq War? Well, that would I mean, the war wouldn't, in Afghanistan? wouldn't that technically include every Libya act that the government itself has done? Pakistan? Like the, the whole idea of the unlawful use of force to coerce people into doing things according to a political or social objective, doesn't that de- very define the political law that we've just been talking about? Yeah, it's pretty interesting if you read uh, the moral just war theory. And uh, Tom Woods will be on in the next hour, and we're going to ask him to speak briefly on just war theory, um, the Christian just war theory. I've been thinking about that with Iran, where we have people that are so eager to go to war with Iran. You know, I was actually thinking about Lisa, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> How she was calling in the other day to talk about the uh, the Elitist. one world government, the elitists, the shadow government, whatever, wanting to control the world. That's fine. And at the same time, saying we need to attack Iran, well... Wouldn't it make sense that it would be the same elitist shadow government that's pushing for the war in Iran? If they control everything behind the scenes, aren't they controlling this war with Iran? Would that make sense? Uh, they, they, or they, they excuse themselves from God that. wouldn't allow that, Josh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> right. I'm sorry I had to bring that up. Just 458 stuck in my talk brain. is the number. Good morning. Welcome to the Saturday morning wake-up call. Who's this? This is Lee. Lee, what's on your mind today? Well, you kind of caught my attention with a comment about the, the drug usage here just a little bit ago. And it just has always uh, amazed me that the none of the legislators, local, state, or federal, have to subject themselves to a drug test. <laughs> And it would seem to me that if in, anybody is more threatening to the the world than the legislators, it would seem they ought to just be able to pass a drug test randomly a couple times a year just to be sure that when they're affecting us with their brilliant legislation, and I use the brilliant word uh, in its broadest context. <laughs> um, You're being very kindly. I'm trying to be politically correct on a very difficult subject. The very fact that but, you called into this program proves that you're not capable of being politically correct, but thank you anyway, Lee. I, well, <laughs> but I didn't say I was politically correct. I said I'm <laughs> trying to be politically correct. There's a subtle difference. Nevertheless, I'd like a comment on on why it, we, we have random... We, we don't even drug test our police officers. Um, it, it just... It just bothers me that the people that really need to be drug tested the most, it would seem to me, have escaped it or eluded it or been sheltered from it or all of the above by all of the above. I Exempted guess. themselves from it. But, and it's not just the drug testing. Though. Look at how many laws in general in which the oh, yeah. people who write the laws are exempted right. from them. It's just another one of the exemptions that I really think should be – it would be interesting to see the vote on that. And especially with not Lisa Pegger, but another Lisa, how she might vote on that. And I'll uh, close that with that comment. You know, I, I, but Lee, I'd like to comment. Thanks. And Lee, thank you for the call. I, I, I have one question about that. And as we're getting ready to go to the, we're about a minute away from the news here. A question just to, to consider would such a drug test include testing for the Kool Aid to see how many politicians have drunk the Kool Aid? 
so to speak. Well, I like what he said about the legislature being legislature being the most dangerous thing in the world. Shouldn't they be drug tested? Yeah. Good enough. We're coming up on the Fox News here in about a minute. If you've got a comment you'd like to share with us, you can do so by calling in at 458-TALK, 458-8255. You realize today is St. Patrick's Day. Top of the morning to you. We're going to have to go out. You know what? Yesterday I was thinking about it, how uh, the local government seems to think I'm a leprechaun. You know why? Because they're after me pot of gold. 458 Talk is the number. You can call us and participate in the Saturday morning wake up call. Coming up on the Fox News right now on KFAR, local talk radio online at KFAR660.com, right there on the World Wide Web. Tell all your friends and join us in the chat room. Fair. All right, welcome back to the Saturday morning wake up call right here on KFAR. We are local talk radio. I am Steve Floyd. Now, uh, joining me in the studio today from Bighorn Enterprises, Josh Bennett. Good morning, Josh. Good morning. And from Far North Tactical, is Aaron Bennett. Good morning, Aaron. Good morning. Eve. All right. Are you Are you awake yet? Yep. <laughs> Good. Uh, four five eight talk is the number. We've already got some call coming back in. Anything you want to say before we go back to the phones? Shouldn't this song be back in green today? Oh, yeah, so I suppose you know we could uh, have the ACDC guys dressed in green and dancing around the. Uh, <laughs> this video and singing, I suppose. Hey, good morning, caller. Who's this? Red. Red, what's on your mind? Uh, did you get a chance to look at uh, page uh, B2 on the day's paper where it says prosecutor slams the self-defense bill? Yeah, that was how that was what we started the uh, the show with today. Was talking about how the uh, they basically said that we should not be able to be trusted with being able to defend ourselves. That we must continue to consider retreat. Well. He gave two or three examples in uh, two legislators who were down in Juneau or whatever, and all three of them are irrelevant to what the law, you know, what they, you know, trying to pass. You know, he talks about a guy that was drunk with a pistol, firing shots in the air, and somebody came by, and how that would have been overturned if that law had been in effect, which is wrong. If you're drunk, you're and intoxicated, you can't have a weapon. You know, pistol in your possession, or rifle, or anything. You know, and all the other uh, two other little scenarios he said, they were wrong totally too. You know, it had nothing to do with nothing about that law. Mm. I read it three times, and I come up with the same thing. Everything he said was wrong. Of course, you're trying to make sense out of political law, so that's no surprise. You're trying to <laughs> use the the ideology of whether this case scenario or that case scenario should apply to or should apply to this certain type of political law, it's a joke. There's only there's only one law, and that's common law. If you didn't hurt anybody, then you didn't commit any crime. And it's once you muddle that, then you can never figure anything out. Well, and and nowadays, if you've noticed, even if you do hurt somebody, who's the who's the first victim that gets recompensed? It's the state, the right? State. The state interferes and says you have to go to jail to pay your debt to society. Well, what about the person who you wronged? Do they, does If you vandalize somebody else's property, do they get restitution first? No, you get thrown in jail first. What if you kill If they somebody? get restitution at all. At all. Yeah, exactly. The state's going to get restitution. Yeah, either by them making license plates for them for free or finding them whatever... Fine, they feel Usually like, they're you know, getting fined. Yeah. All right. Well, I thank you for the program. Thank you, Brad. Appreciate you calling in. 458-TALK is the number. Welcome to the Shadow Your Morning Wake-Up Call. Who's this? Are you hey, there? Yeah, are who you is it? to me? Yeah, it might be. Oh, okay. What's your name? Uh, Sherry. Sherry, thanks for calling in. What's on your mind? Well, I have so much on my mind. I am I guess my husband calls me a radical. I have been getting emails from all over the United States and I've gotten one from a young attorney, a student, that wants to divorce the country, you know, Republicans and Democrats, and we take one half, they take the other half. But as far as guns, we, our family has been infested with drugs since we've been up here. My husband and I not, but our children. 
and uh, we've got one in prison for two life terms. You're, he was a brilliant guy, I'm telling you. Anyway, uh, when all this happened to him, we had many drug dealers calling here, some threatening, some trying to help. And one of them said that uh, they were so infested in the drug world that they had to buy themselves out of it. And the last delivery that this person had made was to lawyers and judges' houses. Big party. I know for a fact that if you demanded drug tests of the officials, they'd be in jail right along with the rest of them. And as far as the guns, if they ever come to my house and try to take my guns, I guess we're all going to jail because... I have my rights, and I will defend them. And I'm an old woman, and I'm disabled. Are you still able to pull a trigger? You betcha. Well, I guess you're not disabled enough, then, are you? (laughs) I've got one sitting right here by my bed. I just cannot stand what Obama is doing to our country. I just, I've never been so upset in my life. Now, hang on a second for for just a moment, Sherry. Okay. I want I want you to to consider very carefully and give me the answer the best you can. Okay. Uh, of all the laws that have been passed since President Obama took office, how many of them were passed by his official decree, and how many of them were passed by the Congress? I think he's doing it all. I don't think he considers what Congress cares about or says. It's, uh, I've never seen a president like this. Well, but I, I need to point out to you, though, that he actually has not. He he has done very little, actually, in terms of official executive order. You're most right. most You're of right. the things that we're seeing happen are be happening because of the other people that we've elected to Congress, both the Senate and the House of Representatives. It is the mass of people that are what is it? Five hundred and thirty-five of them down there. Yeah. In Washington D.C., it is those people who are doing this to our country, and and I and I just want to be. Uh, oh. oh yeah, we just had a little little disaster here. I just spilled my coffee on my phone. That's going to be sad. Well, thank God it wasn't your laptop. Well, you know, I've, I've heard it that. was his lap, though. Yeah, <laughs> I heard that uh, analogy a bunch of times lately that we should split the country, divorce. I've got some. If you're interested, uh, you could I could call you back and give you these. <laughs> email things that I've got. Well, what, what, I was gonna, what I was going to say about that is um, what part do the people that love freedom get? Because what about the people that don't want to be uh, Nazis or communists? Well, it's not in our favor at any. I mean, you're going to get the mark. I mean, this is the beginning of the mark as far as I'm concerned. And he's going to well, demand just, uh, this public, this national ID card. Who is? Obama. You this know that George Bush, George was the Bush one introduced that. that. Introduced yeah, that. I'm sure he was. Yeah. I mean, this these people. I'm telling you. <laughs> well, what I'm what I'm trying to get at there is, if they split the country between Republicans and Democrats, we all lose. Not necessarily. Well, sure. Where are the people that uh, want to be free going to live? With the Republicans. <laughs> the Republicans that gave us the Patriot Act, the NDAA. The Republicans that introduced the Real ID Act that you were just talking about? Well, maybe we need to clean house, huh? Yep. Well, I think that the Republicans are dominating right now, aren't they? In the As far as laws being passed. That's right. scary. Thanks, thanks for the call, Sherry. 458-TALK is the number. Let's go on to the next call. Good morning. Who's this? Good morning. This is Josh. How you doing? Josh, good. What's on your mind? Well... I'm, I'm afraid to yawn now after hearing that uh, article you guys were talking about. <laughs> but uh, I stayed up all night, you know, because somebody was wrong on the Internet. And so I'm pretty tired this morning. But uh, I had a question. I was uh, I was having this discussion with a guy, and he was talking about, you know, because I pay my taxes, I have opted into the system. And so now I'm, like, responsible for all the bad things that happen because I'm contributing to it. And uh, unless I just completely get off the grid and refuse to contribute at all, refuse to participate in the economy, that uh, that I am giving my consent because it's, you know, financial consent. And, I, you know, that I, I scared me to death. I was wondering what you guys thought about it. Well, that kind of goes uh, down the line of a... Uh... Um, discussion I was having with a friend of ours named Scott, and 
he was talking about how he's free. He was talking about he's free. Everybody else isn't free, but he's free. And I asked him if he registered his vehicle, if he paid his insurance, if he paid his taxes, if he bought his hunting license, just all the way down the lines, and it was a yes to all those. And so how is he any more free than anybody else? If, I would... if you're participating 100% in the system... You're 100% in the system. Even if you're only participating 30% in the system, you're still 100% in the system. And it's uh, that's a really good question well, we have to ask ourselves is, are we, because we are complicit, right? We don't want to go to jail, so we pay our taxes. Right, yeah. We don't want to have our home taken. We don't want the cops to come shoot us because we didn't pay our taxes. So exactly. we do it. So are yeah, we... Know. Are we just as guilty by doing that when we do have the option to not do it? It's the consequences we don't like. Yeah. Well, that's what he said, you know, at the end at the end of the discussion. He's like, Josh, tell me what courageous thing you're doing to oppose all this bloodshed that occurs in your name besides calling me an idiot on the Internet. You know, I thought, I thought for, for a while, I said, well, you know, I, I called other people an idiot. I mean, that, that kind of took courage. <laughs> I mean, I got a lot of idiots in my clip. I can fire off those at, at will, basically. But but apart from talk, you know, I'm, I'm not doing a whole lot. My grandfather was uh, put in jail. Uh, he was drafted uh, into the Korean conflict and refused to go. He was in jail for about two years before they released him. And and that has courage, but, you know, I, I'm, I'm not in a similar situation. It, it kind of got me questioning myself. Anyway, I just leave you guys with that and, Listen to the rest of your Thanks uh, for, the, for the call, Josh. And it's always good when we get calls like that, the people that ask a question that make you think to yourself. Because I, I, I grew up in a household that basically quoted Scripture that said, Render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. We have to pay our taxes because it is what the Lord wills. We have to, do, we have to obey the laws, like the speed limit laws and the... And, and and whatever law they pass, if they pass a law that says that we cannot have guns, then by George, we're going to turn in our guns because we must obey the law because the scripture tells us to. How can you morally pay your taxes knowing that you're funding Planned Parenthood? That's And is it Caesar's? I mean, I like to think of what the people that use that to justify, well, I mean, basically they're just making themselves feel better about what they're actually doing, helping the system, helping pay for abortions and unjust wars. But uh, in that same Bible, doesn't it say that uh, God owns the cattle on a thousand hills? Doesn't Isn't that implying that he owns everything? So what is Caesar's? Is Caesar's any and everything that he decides is his? Does that mean that it is his? Well, Caesar himself seemed to think that the citizens of Rome belonged to him, that the very people themselves were his to decide what to do with. And if you look at the kinds of laws that are coming out of Washington, D.C., I mean, how many? if you look at how many laws actually direct, directly affect our personal bodies. If you're going to believe that, then you need to believe in the divine right of kings which is how we ended up with the system we have today. True. Is people looked at it and decided that there was no divine right of kings. Those were the big discussions between Locke and... I can't remember the other Hobbes. guy's name because I didn't want to read his book. <laughs> Wasn't it Hobbes? I think so. Yeah. Well, that's, a really good inter- that's a really good thing for us to think about, though, is what can we do, what have we done, and our, is our complacency... And what are we doing? We say that we hate abortion, right? But we allow them to take our money every year, and that money goes to pay for abortions. We say that we hate the war on drugs because it's throwing people in jail needlessly. Some of those people are sick. They need medical attention, not sitting in a cage. But we freely give them – well, it's not freely. It it is coercion. Mm -hmm. I mean, but we allow them to coerce our money from us, to steal – I mean, we do allow it to throw people in jail for that. We do allow them to take money from us to throw people in jail for not paying a speeding ticket. We let them take our money from us to go and kill people indiscriminately in other countries, even though we find that morally unjust. 
So what do we do about that? I mean, that's a really good question. Do you, you can vote with your feet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You can leave, you can opt out. That's one of the things that Dave Giesel has talked about a number of times here from uh, the Riverbanks Campaign for Liberty. Is he going to be here uh, this morning? No, he's on still. John Locke also spoke about it. But America is the freest place in the world, Josh. Yeah, that's also wrong, huh? Uh, oh no, it's a really good thing. I th- you know, we are now the ninth. What the ninth? Tenth. Freeze. Tenth. Oh, we've done. Okay. One of the things that he said though, he goes, well, I'm, besides talking to people, I think that's the only thing we can do because what is this war all about? It's a war of uh, the hearts and minds, as Dr. Paul would say, and it really is. Until you change people's minds, nothing will change, and maybe no one will change. I don't know. All four lines are on hold. 458-TALK is the number. Good morning, caller. Welcome to the Saturday morning wake-up call. Who's this? This is... Hello? Yeah, go ahead. What's your name? Yeah. This is Bill from the Boondocks. Bill from the Boondocks. What's on your mind? Well, I've been listening to your show. We finally rigged up enough antenna to be able to hear you guys. Can I ask you something real quick? Yes. Do people put you down because that's the side of town you were born in? <laughs> Down in the boondocks. Down in hey, the... <laughs> hey, it's Bill Gill. Yeah, that's me. Hey, buddy, how you been? Uh, pretty good. Long time no see. <laughs> that must be like a mile-long antenna you got. Yeah, we figured something out here. Anyway, <laughs> uh, what, what I want to just... I'm, I'm hearing what you guys are saying, but what I would like to uh, uh, elaborate on is, you know, you, you hear people say, well, here in America, you have an, as much liberty as you can afford to buy, meaning people with a lot more money are able to uh, have their liberty, or it seems that way, because they can buy their way through things. But I've also noticed, you know, if you're in Fairbanks and you see some of those street people running around pushing uh, shopping carts are actually freer than a lot of people who are working for a living because they have their self-determination. The whole thing about freedom is uh, is you if you have self sufficiency, then you can have self determination. If you can take care of yourself, whether you got enough money or you can uh, you can do things for yourself, that's the basis of your freedom. Uh, I've been listening to you guys uh, trying to get this point across of you know, hey, what is freedom and what is really freedom? And the conversation always gets pulled into politics, and politics is not part of your freedom. It's sort of what you do. It's like, you know, I live in a rural area, and I have to stretch a big antenna out just to hear this stuff. But uh, Well, Bill, why is it that it gets it gets pulled into to the political discussion? Isn't it because we have been so uh, acclimated here in the United States to think that the solution must be through the ballot box instead of through the ammunition box? Haven't we been told that? Haven't we been inculcated with that over and over again in our yes. schools? Yes, and that's what's wrong, you see, because it's what you do to uh, have your freedom. Now, today, with the regulations and stuff, living in an urban area, I mean, I've lived in, I spent about seven years of my life living in Fairbanks, and uh, I really was not free at all. You're, I was forced to work a job, and if I didn't have a job, then all of a sudden, if, if you live in Fairbanks and you're poor, you're a criminal. It's a crime to be poor. Basically, we get, everything becomes more oppressive. You're more freer right. than you are right now because you're more free from... Oppression. From Regulation. coercion. Say again? Coercion. You're not coercion. being coerced to do anything while you're out there. For now. That's right. For now. That's right. That's the For only now. thing. So it's not absolutely what you're saying it is. It's that you're farther away from oppression. That's it. That's pretty that, that much doesn't it make the, That doesn't make the oppression any less. No, I'm, I definitely not. So the I'm conversation's going to go political every time mm-hmm. because that's where it's coming from. And, the, well, and in, in, mm-hmm. a, in a sense, Bill, what you're saying is, is what our what our founders did, too. You look at the pilgrims. Why did they come across the ocean in the first place? Kill Indians. No, they came to get away <laughs> from the oppression, Josh. Exactly. Come on. Now, exactly. but, but what did they bring with them? Oppression. Well, <laughs> it wasn't until the government got involved that we started killing Indians. Yeah. Most yes, people don't recognize the fact that our government killed the what? Indians. That's right. And then we well, didn't get ha- enough there, so we went over to the Philippines and killed those <laughs> Indians too. But how did the how did the uh, pilgrims? Okay, now they weren't the first colonists in here, but we we pay more attention to them. But the same thing happened in Jamestown as in Pilgrim Land. There is that 
what got them their freedom is when they gave up their collective right in the beginning when the collective wasn't working and they mm -hmm. just landed on the beach and they're you know here they are it's november and when they gave up the collective and they uh said okay everybody gets a plot of land and what do you do with a plot of land you get your own benefit from that so what they did was they became as individuals self-sufficient and that gave the group strength and that was part of the beginning of what we've uh try to uh, build here in America, which is, of course, being destroyed mm -hmm. now. Now is the collective was working that, for them? Now, it was, the collective didn't work, and they had to... They almost they, all died off from collective. Mm -hmm. That's right. You know that the colony, the Pilgrim colony, actually eventually did fade away, and the reason for it is that no... When people were coming over from England, and people that lived in along the seaboard over there in eastern America... No one was going and joining the pilgrims. It's a really interesting read. And they eventually, their colony just died off. They got overwhelmed. Yeah. And the reason why, well, no, they weren't overwhelmed. They basically just eventually just disappeared. The reason why is because they never had, while they did have their own property, they were never allowed, and this is a really key point, freedom of conscience. They were never allowed freedom of religion. They escaped England to come to America. Because of, free, of religious persecution, but then they did not allow religious freedom in their own colony. Right. Once they came here, they demanded that you live by their Puritan law. And eventually, if, if, you, were, if you watch them, they depleted. They constantly yeah. were poor and more poor and more poor. And the only way they gained was to send Miles Standish out. Miles Standish captain that they had to go out and raid indians and kill them and take their stuff that's how they that was how really they existed for quite a while because yeah. no one wanted to go live with them because they escaped religious persecution and came here and persecuted way more than what they were getting because they weren't actually being killed off in england but they killed a lot of people when they got here yes and also when when they were they got their colony in new england but other people came, too, that wanted their religious freedom, and the uh, pilgrims were not nice to them. And basically, they were overwhelmed by the immigration from Europe. Yes, yep, which is the Massachusetts colony was the same thing. These people escaped, and it really is fundamental for us to understand if we want to be free. It didn't have any – their religious um, persecution in England, they came to America and started their own religious persecution – even when they had the right to a certain point of private property, which, and I'm just talking about land, they never had the right to their private property of their self-ownership. They never had the right to have freedom of conscience, which is really the American Revolution was about the freedom of conscience, to believe what you want to believe, when you want to believe, and how you want to believe. And we can see our downfall now in the United States directly pointed at the fact that we do not want other people to have freedom of conscience. It's what all political law is about. Regulatory you, law. Yes. Political law. You are not allowed to have freedom of you conscience. You must we obey the, whatever law it is, whether it's speed limits or drugs or alcohol or... Retreat. Yeah, you know, having to retreat in the face of somebody else who's aggressing against you. You must <laughs> obey our... Bill, it's, it's, in other words, how can it not go back to political law? It has to. Well, it will in eventually. Every, well, in every aspect of your life that keeps you from being free, even in your mind, is political law. Yeah, I mean, politics in general can be talked less about. I mean, politicians in general, maybe. But political law or the law of force, the law of power. I can, I can tell be. you exactly how we get drugged down that road is because... It seems like every other caller wants to call in and blame it on the Democrats. Right. Right. And it's just a joke. Or they, we have callers that call in and say, well, if this law were to pass, then we would be more free, which <laughs> we've been here for asking for about two years now. What law has actually made us more free? None of them. <laughs> None of them. Exactly. Right. There is well, not like a law. The law they're trying to, uh, they're trying to get this law passed in Juneau about the self-defense thing so that we can be free to d defend ourselves, but the, uh, the the mush on our freedom is the fact that they have to pass a law that only common sense is that every mm -hmm. human being and every animal 
has a right to defend himself, except, and he says it has a right to be. Except based on Friday's testimony, looks like that bill is already dead. Well, because we'll on Friday they pointed out that you see, if we allow this freedom for people to defend themselves, then the criminals are going to use it as an ex- as a justification to kill more people, and therefore, <laughs> in or, and therefore, in order to protect everyone, we must put everyone under the jackboot. Do you, you know yeah. what the Ninth Amendment to the Constitution? What does the Ninth Amendment to the Constitution say? Does everybody have I their pocket Constitution? How, I got how, mine, but I can't remember. How much of a nerd am I that I just reach over and grab? You don't have George Washington on the front of yours. Oh. I don't even have one. All right. I got uh, mine from your store. All persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States. And no, 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 no. Not article. Um, Bill of Rights. Uh, oh, okay. Sorry. Uh, I thought that was amendment... Oh, wait, wait. That was Amendment 14. I'm sorry. I had an extra. Oh, yeah. Uh, Article Amendment 9. The enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. Let me read that again. The enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. So in other words, just because there are certain rights that are specifically spelled out, for instance, you have the right to keep and bear arms, does not mean that all that those are the only rights you have. Correct. And what it also means is when they wrote the Constitution, what they're saying with the Ninth Amendment was everything that is lawful for you to do now before this is signed is lawful for you once it's signed. So everything that was lawful for the colonists, which was common law, the right to defend yourself... We're still, we still retain the right to defend ourselves. It's not given by this book. It wasn't given by the document. They were saying every, just because we're enumerating some of these rights, the first 10 amendments, does not mean that the rights that we already have, the God-given rights of common law that we've struggled with over a thousand years, we have those rights even with this document. So we had the right to self-defense then. You had the right to carry a rifle or a weapon. You had the right to travel when any means that you wanted. We have those rights now. Wait, wait, wait. You, are you telling me that they didn't have checkpoints set up in between Massachusetts and, and New York in which you had to strip down to your undies and pass through a... During the war uh, against the people. Oh, oh wait. You, are you telling me that you did not have to produce your papers? Only to, during to, the war to demonstrate the, that you were in fact a lawful citizen. Only during the war against the people. That's that's a big mistake that a lot of people make, or actually almost everyone I've ever met makes, is they talk about their rights. They talk about, I I know my rights. I I know my rights. No, I don't think you do. I know my rights. I know the law and what I say. I saw. I saw. <laughs> right. Well, they view their rights as being granted to them in the Constitution. <coughs> Which that's not even close to the case. It wasn't. No, you're you're born with your rights, and you're born with your own self-sufficiency. As long as you hold it, you will hold more of your own rights. Well, even... If you're dependent on the government to feed you or protect you, or uh, you know, put your house fire out, you are having to pay to them some of your work. Your your money is your labor, and they want to make it so. And I don't know who they are, but it seems to be constantly working in that direction that you don't own your labor. Hey, yeah. we are out of time for today here on uh, the Saturday Morning Wake Up Call. Appreciate the phone call. We're going to take a short break here for the Fox News and come back with Patriots Lament on the other side. Tell all your friends to call in at 458-TALK. And welcome to Patriots Lament right here on KFAR. If you are just joining us, this is actually kind of the second hour of uh, our Saturday morning. We, we start with the Saturday morning wake-up call now at 9 a.m., but basically uh, we talk about the same issues, and, and that has to do with freedom and liberty and uh, your personal rights. Where do you get them? How do you keep them? Uh, joining me in the studio now from Far North Tactical, I've got uh, Aaron Bennett. Good morning, Aaron. Good morning, Steve. Of course, we want to remind you that if oh, you are... he woke up. If you're looking to uh, defend yourself or your family, then one of the best places you can go here in town is Far North Tactical over there at 8th and Lacey. Not to go and uh, let them defend you, but to go and purchase the items you need to defend yourself. Also joining us from Bighorn Enterprises, the other, uh, the other main sponsor of our Saturday mornings. Uh, Bighorn Enterprises, of course, if you are looking for uh, some dirt work or uh, you've got a very fat contract that you'd like to uh, 
takes. And <laughs> we take those. I'm, te- I'm teasing a bit here. Josh, Josh Bennett from Bighorn Enterprises is here. Good morning, Josh. Good morning. And uh, also now joining us from uh, the Fairbanks Campaign for Liberty, we've got uh, Sam Van der Good morning. Did I, did I say that right? Uh, close enough. Uh, close enough. Uh, San Van, van der Hoeven Holland. Okay. <laughs> welcome, to the, welcome to the program, gentlemen. Do you all have your papers this morning? Papers, please. Does an iPad count? Uh, as long as I can prove that uh, that iPad shows that you are who uh, I think you are, then it's got your uh, your your government issued identification number on it. And I brought a gun. And uh, boy, mm, I don't know about that. Yeah, you, cause, yeah. I can prove it's me. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for being here. Uh, we, we have uh, all four lines still on hold from last hour. Do you want me to evaporate those and start fresh? We can hit them. All They're right. kind enough to stay on. 458 Talk is a number. Good morning, caller. Who's this? Good morning, Steve. Gentlemen, this is Mark. Mark, good morning. Well, I'm glad to hear you all touching on the difference between legal and lawful. Uh, I have trouble telling the difference between uh, Republicans and Democrats myself. And I'm more worried about the new chi uh putting in a new Politburo and old uh, KGB Putin himself taking back over power. I think we better tuck, duck, and cover, gentlemen. Oh. Along those lines, yeah. I don't know if anyone's read about the new NSA uh, complex that they're building in Utah, over one million square feet, and their stated purpose is to be able to watch or collect every transmission that goes on in the United States, every single one, well, every Korea call. Can- if North Koreans can put a satellite up in space, they can put a bomb in your backyard. I'm going to get off the line out here, gentlemen. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. Appreciate the call. And you, you, you make a good point, Josh, too, about the NSA. It wasn't the the whole point of the National Security Agency to protect us from the very people that Mark was just talking about, the Russians, the Chinese, the other uh, foreign nations that might be attempting to eavesdrop on us. Why would they be trying to eavesdrop on the United States of America. Are are the people themselves now the enemies of the state? I would say yes. I mean, if we just throw the bones out here, it's, of course, we are the enemy of the state. The people are, because as long as there are any remnants of freedom in America, any remnants of free people, that's a threat to the government. 458 Talk is the number. Good morning, caller. This is Patriots Lament, and it looks like we have now uh, gone through the rest of the line. Well, we promised everyone that... Or, um, that Tom Woods is going to be on the radio show today, and he has not called in yet. All right. Does he have the hotline number to call? Start crying. To call? Yes, he does. All right. All right. Does. So we'll be watching the hotline. Four five eight talk is the number. Good morning, caller. Who's this? Oh, hello. Hey, who is this? <laughs> My name is Betsy. Betsy, thanks for calling in. What's on your mind? Oh, thanks. Well, I've just been listening, and um, I guess I'm one of these communication people, but uh, I know I was here uh, in different group settings, and stuff. they talk about how. It's really good to let your experience out, let your perception out, but then it's really good to kind of get that hope thing. Or, and I know hope and change is a real negative term, but, you know, get an action step out of it. Get something, well, what should we do? Or is there anything we can do? I mean, I know the program is lament, but at some point, <laughs> actions are good. Well, we do actually try uh, at some point during the show to give an action point. I think that's good. And, you know, different callers have come in and they've talked about, you know, maybe we should relook at oppression and what do we mean and how are we and sure, I mean, I don't know, someone out on Second Avenue, that's pretty bad. And three below, I'd feel pretty oppressed regardless of if I had a job or didn't. But um, I know that it's important, you know, for, for real change to happen, that we take some of this wonderful, intelligent insight and channel it creatively. Otherwise, it starts to feel, I turn on the radio, I can hear in the background just the muffled tones of sort of a sense of kind of, of fear and oppression and hopelessness. And out of that, I don't think anything's going to, you know, happen. And, and if, if we give up hope, then... You know, people hear us complaining, and, and they think, oh, I don't want to hear that anymore. That's a loser attitude. And they throw the candidate that's associated with those complaints and that wants to make the change into kind of the garbage can. And so if we're representatives of seeing something different and something better, then I think we need to add that in and say, I don't like these laws. But instead of just saying political law sucks or this sucks or this legislature sucks or ha, 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 let's drug test them, wait a minute, let's, what, do you, what do you really want to see happen? Do you want to just sit and complain and chase your tail, or do you want to, here's what I want to see, because this is the way it was, and this was better, and this is why it's better. Light a fire under somebody so that things can move in a direction as opposed to just get a deeper rut. That's that, all I have. No, what, that's, that's what, a great idea. Go ahead. What, what, what was better? Well, I'm just saying that um, in general, regardless of if you're a communist or if you're a socialist or if you're for the far right or far left, 
you know, that if you want to sell your soap, you don't do it with complaining about the other soap. You do it with, you do it by saying, this soap is better because it has pow or wow or whatever. You know, I'm not, I'm not a great political expert. I'm more of a communication person, like I said at the beginning. And so I'm just saying that, you know, if it's Ron Paul, for God's sake, then let's talk about amending the Constitution in this way and that way, and here's what you'll have. You know, and I know the whole thing is not a show about, you know, selling, but it is. If it isn't, then what are you doing? We can all bitch and complain, but in the end, if you, you just, okay, we'll come back again, punch in, punch out, like the cartoon with the, the sheepdog and the, you know. <laughs> Martin so, Ralph. So that's where I'm Martin from. Fred. Well, we have, in order to go back to, well, we're not going to go back. In order to make things, quote unquote, better, or what should it be, that's, we do talk about what it should be. That's the whole point of this show. But unless people understand fundamentally what liberty is, what their freedom means, where it came from, the, la, the lament part, how it's being taken mm-hmm. away, you can't expect any change at all. Well, it's well, about the hearts and minds. I mean, we sure. are not going to give any political action points. Oh, I'm not okay. going to tell you to go vote for so-and-so, except for Ron Paul. <laughs> well, and we're it. not going to tell that's, you to well, do... So you just said it. I mean, bottom line is, how long... Okay, 20 minutes lament, one minute action step. But if I turn on the radio and I just hear people saying, this is awful, that's awful, and that's all they do for about... Then I might as well watch a soap opera, because it's the same thing, and it's built on that, and it just reruns itself until we can you know, uh, give somebody an award for a television. You know what I mean? Saying? I mean, it just sure. there's no end to that. Well, but at some we point, do... there should be an, a step. Or, you know, even if it's 10 seconds before the end of the show, well, you know what? This was awful, wasn't it? Yeah, but guess what? We have a way out. Stay tuned next week, and we'll tell you, and then they'll bring them back at least. You know what I'm saying? Uh, that's all I'm saying. It's oh, nice there, there is, that's, the, that's the problem, though. Why is it a problem? Well, you, because there is no way out. Well, then why is we, you know, God, life sucks then. Let's just, if the show is about liberty and you're just going around in oppressed mode all the time, and you can use the word a million times and talk about, well, this is not good and this is not good, but in the end, I mean, is that how we got the country the way we, the way, you know, when we start out, the people were. No, they got, the, they had an armed revolution. Is that what you want? Well, you keep putting it on me to kind of make, I mean, I don't know why you feel like you need to be defensive about it. Well, I'm, I'm trying to make I'm the not show being more defen- positive I'm not... and more people will watch. Mm-hmm. And in the end, if you want to see, you know, these changes, then I'm just saying change the tone a little bit. I mean, you know, throw in a few com- positive comments every now and then beyond just the humor, which is wonderful. But, you know, a few comments to say, you know, what I'd like to see is, I mean, if you know enough to know that this is a problem, then you should know enough about having an idea about getting around it. Otherwise, if you were a candidate, who would vote for you? Ah, uh-huh. yeah, no, no, wait, right there. This is, that's the second time, or maybe the third time, and since you've called, that you have made reference as if somehow we are looking for a political solution, that now somehow we are asking people to vote for a candidate, and well, and that can right there is can't you, if no. You're talking about principles, the the whole point of it is is that the political system is what has gotten us into trouble by by putting our faith and our trust into politics instead of into the individual. I mean, the fact that you are looking for a political solution betrays the fact that you are not understanding what we're saying. Well, it just seems to be unrealistic because a bunch of people, individuals they are, whether it's outlaws in Australia or whatever, come together and they build a society, even if it's a society of people that respect each other's spaces, which is what it sounds like we want here. I certainly do. I think we agree on that. Well, isn't it more unrealistic to think that you're going to change what is by using what is? I feel like, you know, your uh, your tactics are kind of trying to, like, knock me off center. And all I want to say, and I'll go away now so you can have your party <laughs> back of misery. But um, I, all I'm saying is is that if you want to, you know, bring more people in and, 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 and build a sense of a consensus, uh, in, or even just a stronger show with more people calling in, which maybe that's, that's not an issue, it seems to me that people would be drawn by something that's hopeful of moving out of something that's sort of negative feeling and moving into something positive, just kind of basic stuff. And I'm just saying that if, you know, if, you know, if you want to do that, maybe one way is to throw in, hey, have you thought about, uh, you know, uh, looking at this is more of an important issue than something else. You know, in any given situation, staying away from you know what feels like oppression and moving towards what is, as you say, what is liberty? Well, let's you know maybe the show could feel more liberated if it it did some of that. You know, move towards some of those. How could we change that? You know, and that's still not talking about any candidate. That's just talking about political ideals. 
I mean, to right, say, but you know, here, I'm here's one thing, and I'm taking it into account real quick before you take that, is I pay for the first hour, Josh pays for the second hour, and they're basically our shows, and we like to come on here and talk about what is and what should be. The show isn't really about trying to find... In the mode of Thomas Paine, Thomas Paine wrote something called Common Sense. It started mm-hmm. the revolution, and it was a patriot's lament. Indeed. 458-TALK is the number. Now we've got that uh, call coming in on the hotline. Good morning. Are you there? All right, that hotline uh, did drop, so it looks like if we were uh, looking to get that uh, Tom Woods on here. Can, can I get to make a point? Go I ahead, actually, Sam. I actually am going to be the voice of dissent here, and I actually agree with her to some extent. Um, and and you, we, Go out. we do. Yes. Yeah, leave, leave now. I did not be tolerated. There would be no dissent. to the party line. You you guys do, you know, say, oh, read this book, and here's some good ideas, and there's some action points. Um, but there's not to say that we couldn't do more of that. Sure. Um, and, and, you know, here's one positive thing. Um, I have an economics group I meet with. It's uh, uh, every other Friday, um, and I can put the details on the blog. So anybody who wants to come and, and join there, that's one way to get, you know, learn learn stuff, get educated. Um, we, we, we discuss Austrian economics and philosophy, and, um, I mean, that's a positive step. It's just people learning, learning history, learning principles. Um, I mean, so, so there's, there's always more things we yeah, can do like that. Isn't that what this show... Isn't that what the show is? Is learning history, learning okay. learning concept. I think what she's asking for, and I don't want to put words in her mouth, but based on what she was saying, she's asking for an overall general answer. Mm, I mean, well, I, and I think what I've heard from an awful lot of other other people besides that ju- that caller that just uh, contributed. By the way, we do appreciate that. Uh, it is that what people would like to see is a quick and easy fix. Tell me who to vote for, so that that person can go in there and fix things. Tell me what I can go and buy, so that product that product that I'm, I'm that I'm going to go purchase that's, that's is going to make my I, life better. That's not what I understood her to say. She just sounded like she wanted to have, you know, yeah. a little bit, a change in tone, which is, you know, that's fine. That's fine. That's a good. Uh, but I mean, take that into mm-hmm, consideration. Absolutely. We're yeah. talking about like the NSA monitoring people's phone calls. You know, you were just mentioning that earlier in the show. There's even practical things you can do to get around that. Um, and maybe I'll start posting on the blog some of these things you can do. You can encrypt your email. Wait, 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 wait. Go back to the NSA thing because I'm I'm concerned about some of the clicks and buzzes that I've heard when I've been on the phone with other people. Am I being monitored? I have no idea. Well, I'm, I'm not with the NSA. No, okay, but I mean, just just <laughs> off the top of your head, what's something that I can do to help keep my my communications at home a little more private? Um, with your phone, I don't have an answer right off the top of my head. Um, I probably could figure something out, but with your email, like you can encrypt your email. Right, but we um, can go we can go on Alex Jones and figure out all the conspiracy theory <laughs> ways. The show isn't about trying to figure out a way to circumvent the government. I oh, mean, email encryption true. isn't a conspiracy theory. <laughs> no, no, I understand that, but uh, the show isn't about trying to see how far in a hole you can dig and hide it. And absolutely not. But I, I mean, it's it's yeah okay. I mean, I, I'm not saying go into a cabin with your guns and you know tin your food you and tinfoil hats. Your cabin with I'm tin just saying foil. like <laughs> you wouldn't want someone to open your your, your on letters. <laughs> there's there's ways to protect yourself. I mean, they're really sure. simple, easy, practical steps you can take yourself. And it's not about hiding in a cabin in the woods. It's just about practical steps you can take that make you a little bit more secure. You'll never be perfectly safe, but why not take a few steps? Mm-hmm. Four five eight talk is the number. Good morning, caller. Welcome to Patriots Lament. Who's this? Well, this is Trevor, and a happy St. Patrick's Day to you. Happy St. Patty's Day. Are you going to kiss the Blarney Stone this morning? Well, no need. I'm Irish. All right. Well, good for you. <laughs> What's on your mind? <laughs> uh, got the general thought here, and it's kind of their catch-22 that I don't appreciate that's behind it. Um, that the court continu- continually uses the fact that they say that ignorance of a law is no excuse for not obeying it. And yet last year alone, at the count that I the last count that I saw, they passed something like forty thousand new pages of regulations. <laughs> How in the heck is anybody in their right mind or ability mm-hmm. even sitting on the house eating Cheetos or something? able to read all of those laws so that you know what they are. Not even the people who passed the laws by their own admission have read what they've passed. Yeah. Oh, no, we see that we got to pass it so we can find out what's in it. Let's put no. a positive spin on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just, 
put a positive spin on it all right. Now we know who Take we don't away, want Sam. in government. <laughs> but, uh, no, it's it's one of those of, I look at where we're going right now, and for that lady who's the last caller, I'm going to make this slightly political. It looks like our nominee from the Republican Party is going to be a guy in his former state who passed a law that bans assault weapons. All right. Mm-hmm. Is that Ron Paul? I have yet to see no. anything in my life that qualifies as an assault weapon. I have seen firearms that take extra training to use. I have seen some that take a special permit or a tax. But I have yet to see anything that would qualify as an assault weapon until you use it in an assault. I, well, what classifies an assault weapon is in a medium... Um, a medium-sized cartridge that's capable of sustained fire, semi-automatic yeah, and sustained fire. Yeah, it's Sturmgewehr. Huh. Exactly. I've been assaulted by weapons on my entire life. Every time I look at one, they no, assault no, me. No, he's exactly <laughs> right. That <laughs> vicious. They need to be locked up. The Sturmgewehr was the very first official assault weapon, and there's been many made after that, but that is the definition of one. Thanks for the call. Yeah. Appreciate it. 458 Talk is a number. This is Patriot's Lament. Who's on my phone? Nobody. All right, go ahead. Aaron, you were saying about assault weapons. What is it that makes an, a weapon, is it the fa- is it how it's used or how it's made or, or what it looks like that scares people so much? Oh, I don't know what scares people so much. Guns don't kill people. I do. <laughs> Four, five, eight, talk is the number. Good morning. This is Patriot's Lament. Who's on my phone? Hey, good morning. It's Natalie. Hey, Natalie. How are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you guys doing? Good, good, good. Thanks I'm for disappointed calling. I'm that Tom's not there, but I wanted to put a kind of a plug-in for him. Natalie is calling right now. Can we go? Oh, yes. All course. right, okay. Natalie, I'm going to keep okay. you on hold, okay? okay so I'm going to thanks. see if I can try to get, uh, uh, is this Tom on the phone? Yes, I, I am so sorry. I have never in years and years and years of doing radio ever, ever simply flat out forgotten, and I Oh, you my deepest apology. <laughs> no, you know I, that we, you are forgiven. We years oh, and you years are... of doing this, and I, I, yeah, here I am thinking, boy, I'm getting so much done today. I've got the house is all clean, the kitchen's great, <laughs> dishwasher's running. Uh, well, we owe you our deepest gratitude. Thank you very much. All right, we've in. thrown a lot of chum in the water this morning, so <laughs> we, we got a, a feeding frenzy going on, and all of our lines are on hold, Tom. So, uh, Josh, why don't you go ahead and introduce why we have Tom on the on the phone this morning? Uh, well, we've asked him to come on basically because he's awesome. Well, thanks. <laughs> um, he's from the Mises Institute. He's wrote very many books that are outstanding. Um, I particularly like some of the things. Well, he's a friend of Ron Paul. We like that, too. But um, particularly some of the things that he talks about that I really like are nullification, um, the Tenth Amendment. I mean, I know we can get into states and federal government. You know, we don't like either one, really. But also his um, – I really think your your – Theory, the way that you speak about just wars. I've read a couple of your recent posts and blogs and one of your speeches. They're fascinating. Um, I was hoping, actually, that you could talk a little bit about just war, because that's something that here locally that we have a lot of conversation of, we need to go bomb Iran, yeah. or the justification of Iraq. And um, Actually, recently we had a guy call in that spoke about um you know presidential war powers and he brought up the uh quasi war the quasi yeah. yeah 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 which does not yeah i can address all this if you like yes right. sir please it's all yours. right Go well <clears throat> first of all <clears throat> excuse me when when the issue of war comes up you will hear from the neoconservative crowd which are a lot of a lot of people who are neoconservative don't even know it. They they think they're conservatives. They think, well, I'm the anti Hillary Clinton and I am a conservative. But most people these days who call themselves conservatives really are not. Like people who are reading uh, the Weekly Standard or something. This has nothing to do with with the way conservatism conservatism has been understood. Um, and in particular, they favor this very free hand on the part of the president when it comes to war powers. Now, this is the opposite of what the framers wanted. The British system was one in which the monarch had a very free hand in foreign policy, and as you'll recall, the American Revolution was a fight against that type of system. They didn't say, well, let's get rid of the king, and then we'll establish an elected guy who can do exactly the same things that the king could do. What would the point of that be? So, I mean, every testimony you could imagine uh, involving the framers, the state ratifying conventions, the Federalist Papers, in other words, every source that's relevant at all, 
makes clear that the president does not have the power to commit the nation to war uh, in a, for non-defensive reasons. In an absolute emergency where there's no time to convene the Congress, yes, he can repel an attack. But given that Franklin Roosevelt managed to find time after Pearl Harbor to convene the Congress, I mean, I... That this would have to be some kind of emergency the likes of which we can hardly imagine. It would not be such as what happened in Libya, where, uh, I mean, obviously the United States was not on the verge of collapse because of what was going on in Libya. The whole thing is laughable. But it's very unfortunate to hear people who call themselves conservatives pointing to these episodes in U.S. history uh, that I think, by and large, mostly they've heard on the radio. They've heard, like, Mark Levin <laughs> cite them. But when you look at them closely... You look at the quasi war of 1798 and, and the Barbary pirates in the early 1800s. This does not prove what these people think it, it, they prove because each one of these examples involves Congress passing statutes authorizing and directing and overseeing the the uh, the military uh, expeditions in both cases, where it, it was it was a series of probably a dozen congressional statutes in each case that explained exactly what. The, the nature of the war was what the aims were, what the what we were going to do. So we're going to stop ships that are go, that are that are uh, heading to France and things like that. This was all spelled out by Congress, and the president merely executed the, the congressional policy. That was the understanding. That was every, it. Was not that John Adams just simply said on his own, "I'm going to just start going after fr- French ships." That is absolutely not what happened. Likewise with Thomas Jefferson, it was not simply that he said. I'm just going to send some ships and send them into uh, offensive, in, into battle. To the contrary, he said, I'm going to take ships that the Congress has authorized for purposes of this nature, and I'm going to apply them to defensive maneuvers. But anything that would involve offense, I would have to go to Congress again for authorization, because I can go only as far as defense. Tom, we're up against a break here for okay. the Fox News. we got Tom Woods on the line here on Patriots Lament. We'll be right back. On KFAR, it's the local talk radio. All right, welcome back to Patriots Lament right here on KFAR. If you'd like to call in and be a part of the discussion, all of our lines are on hold right now, so you'll have to bear with us. Keep trying to get in. 458 Talk, the number. Right now we go back to, we've got uh, Tom Woods on the line here uh, from the Mises Institute, right? Mm-hmm. All right, Tom. Uh, yeah, before the break, you're talking a little bit about the just war and uh, the issue of who has the power to declare war. Can we transition a little bit now, maybe, to the issue of nullification? This is something that has come up over and over again. If somebody passes a law, uh, specifically, you know, normally it's it's in the the reference of the federal government passing a law that violates the state constitution or that violate that, that in some way impedes upon the people of a particular state. Does the state have the right? to not comply. Okay, yeah, that's this is this is a fun topic. Uh just to wrap up the previous topic. Uh, t- I mean, I realize I in 2 minutes you can't persuade somebody who holds the view 180 degrees opposed to yours, but on my site I have I put up a page specifically like a, a question and answer catechism on war powers. tomwoods.com is my website and tomwoods.com/warpowers is where I spell out exactly what the powers of the president are, what the powers of the Congress are, why they're still relevant for today. It's not that, well, because we've got crazy people in the world, now we have to give up all our uh, decision-making powers to the president. That's, that's not the case. Um, okay, but getting, but getting to nullification, yeah, this has become, this is, I, I'm sort of the go-to guy on this, because as far as I can see, I'm the only person who's written a book on nullification, <laughs> so that's why people call me. They don't know who else to call. So... Yeah, I wrote a book uh, two years ago called Nullification because what I saw happening was that a lot of these Tea Party people and libertarians and constitutionalists all around the country were starting to think, you know, we've pretty much tried everything, right? We we want to keep this government restrained, and we've tried everything there is. And we keep having conferences, we keep handing out little pocket constitutions, and we keep trying to hold our elected officials accountable, which is, which is like trying to nail jelly to a wall. And we have nothing to show for it. The thing just keeps getting bigger and bigger. It doesn't matter if it's a Republican in office. Sometimes the Republicans are more likely to expand the government and spend. So, you know, what in the world do we do? <coughs> Excuse me. So th- what you've seen more and more is a willingness to consider unorthodox approaches, to consider approaches that, you know, might have been thought out of bounds 
five or six, seven, ten years ago. But now, given that, as I say, every alternative strategy has failed, particularly the let's wait for the Supreme Court to put everything right strategy, is, it, is there a more failed strategy in the history of the world? I mean, I don't know, Gallipoli? I'm trying to think, I mean, what, what, what could possibly be worse than that strategy has not yielded us a thing. So we've got to think in different ways. And if you look around into the Thomas Jefferson toolkit, you find a neglected approach that Jefferson believed was constitutional, was moral, was strategically sound, and was the only way to prevent the federal government from just swallowing up the states. And that was through the use of state nullification, which he spelled out and explained that if this really is a limited government of just enumerated powers, and if the states really do retain all powers that they have not delegated to the federal government, well, how can that mean anything? Seriously, how can that mean anything unless the states can enforce that somehow? When the federal government begins encroaching on their powers, what are they supposed to do? Just hold up the Tenth Amendment fruitlessly, waving it in the face of federal officials? You think that's going to do anything? Of course not. The state has to be able to take positive action and say, we know and you know this law is unconstitutional, and so we're responsible for the people of whatever state it is, and in this state we're not going to allow it to be enforced. It's just, it just not going to happen. And, and the, the lesson of this, the idea that, that's undergirding it, is that if you give the federal government a monopoly on deciding what its powers are, then guess what? It's going to keep discovering new powers all the time. And does that not describe the U.S. government in the 20th century to Absolutely. a T? Absolutely. It's Absolutely. constantly discovering new powers. So that's what nullification is, and it was used for to good effect and for perfectly honorable purposes for the first seven decades of American history. And now, as people are feeling like they've tried everything, well, guess what? It's it's coming up again. Yeah, Tom, I, I've got a question for you. What role did the uh, the federal uh, invasion of the southern states play in in determining that the state nullification may not be? in fact, a valid strategy? Well, um, a lot of people will point that, will, will claim that, well, this is, a, this is ancient history because we've had the war between the states now, and that pretty much destroyed states' rights, so you haven't got a leg to stand on anymore. Well, a couple things to say about that. I mean, number one is, you know, we don't, I don't think we, we hold, certainly we Americans don't hold to the principle that, you know, that the loser of, of a physical confrontation had the worst of the rational argument. I mean, that's not anything we can accept. I mean, if your kid comes home bloodied from the school bully, you don't say to your kid, look, I'm sorry you got beaten up, but obviously that proves you were wrong. Like, <laughs> like, that doesn't, what, what does that mean? So we don't basically hold that, we don't hold that view. And if the U.S. had lost the American Revolution, we wouldn't say, therefore, our cause was wrong and we should never vindicate it again. But secondly, the South was not seceding over the principle of nullification. I mean, the, the idea of the... I mean, you can distinguish secession from nullification. And in fact, to the contrary, the interesting thing is that the southern states were actually complaining not that they were being stopped from nullifying, and that's why they want to secede. They were complaining that the North was nullifying too much. That was their argument. So that, that, ironically enough, the South was taking exactly the position that Hillary Clinton would take on nullification today. They were taking exactly the same position, which is that you're not allowed to do it. And, in fact, Jefferson Davis, the president of the Confederacy, in his farewell speech to the U.S. Senate, denounced nullification. South Carolina, when they seceded December 20th, 1860, listed as one of their grievances nullification on the part of the North. So it, 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 this is totally distinct. The, the, the South was upset that the North was nullifying the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, which had constitutionally dubious provisions in it, uh, in spite of the Fugitive Slave Clause. And this upset the Southern states. In fact, the, the Supreme Court of Wisconsin and the legislature of Wisconsin said that this law is unconstitutional and therefore void and of no effect and will not be enforced in our state. And that's what a lot of northern states did. They simply refused to cooperate or to uh, allow its execution or to allow the use of their local jails or local officials or logistical and informational support. They just simply refused to do it. So I don't think that the Civil War thing settles this at all. Number one, as I say, because violence doesn't settle a, a philosophical dispute. If a really, really big dumb guy is saying 2 plus 2 equals 5, and then he punches you out. That doesn't make it 5. 
right? I mean, the argument is what it is. And then secondly, as I say, the, the, the war wasn't even about nullification, and to the extent that it was, it was fought against the principle of nullification uh, by the southern forces. Uh, nullification is a principle that has been used and referred to and approved of by all sections of the country at one time or another. And in fact, the legislature of Ohio, of all places, in 1820, passed a resolution overwhelmingly in their legislature saying that the majority of Americans accept the principle of nullification. Now, that's Ohio you know, where there wasn't any slavery in 1820. So uh, the, the bottom line is the truth about American history is so much more interesting than the cartoon propaganda version we get from MSNBC or in your typical high school textbook. All right, Tom, I appreciate that. I, I, I have a question here in terms of specifically in Alaska. One of the issues that gets people really riled up about this issue of nullification has to do with how much of the land here in Alaska that's under federal control they step in, they make some kind of a regulation, for instance, about what kind of boat you can drive on the river, and then they're going out sending their goons to throw 70-year-old people, I don't know if you heard about the Jim Wild case, throwing 70-year-old men in the mud because he refused to allow them to board his boat in the middle of the river, which, according to state law, is supposed to belong to the state. And, and so here we have this this legal battle being fought in the court, which basically comes down to no, he was wrong. He's going to have to pay his fine, and let's just uh, bury it and move along. How, how would the state nullify that? Yeah, that's a good question. And to be honest with you, I'm offhand, I don't know. And I, I knew I should have read what's been going on in Utah, <laughs> because Utah has actually passed some, some state laws pertaining to trying to regain some state control over the huge tracts of, of land owned by the federal government. So I don't offhand know what their strategy is, but I would actually just type in Utah federal land and uh, maybe the word nullification into Google and see what comes up. So I, offhand I don't, I don't know. And I will also point out that this particular approach doesn't work in all cases. There are some cases where it would be very difficult to stop the federal government. But I'll give you a, sort of an example of, of how you have a case where the federal government has seems to have jurisdiction in an area. It's got its one of its bureaucracies in charge of something, and yet local officials were able to stop it. And that is in New Jersey uh, late last year. Uh, they're really cracking down the federal government, the FDA, on so-called raw milk. Yeah. A lot of mm -hmm. people are increasingly interested in this. Uh, it's, it's not just a, this is not just a sandals and beads left-wing issue. There are a lot of conservatives, too, who, who are interested in, the, in these health issues. So there was a case of an Amish farmer who apparently was dealing in raw milk and he's not supposed to be doing that, so he was visited and harassed by some FDA bureaucrat. So the local sheriff, uh, I think Brad Rogers is his name, the local sheriff uh, 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 protected him and showed up at his property and said to the FDA bureaucrat, uh, you can't just arbitrarily show up at this guy's property, make demands, and start snooping around. If, if, you, if you don't come back here with a warrant and you try to set foot on this guy's property again, I'm going to arrest you for trespassing. That's what the sheriff said. And what the FDA hemmed and hawed and screamed and caterwauled and all this, but ultimately they gave in. They gave it because, as my friend Sheriff Mack from Arizona, Sheriff Richard Mack says, if there's one thing the federal government does not want, it is a, an altercation with a local sheriff because it is a lose-lose situation for them. It's, it's lose, number one, if the sheriff happens to emerge victorious, then it's lose for them. But secondly, even if they win, it's a pyrrhic victory, because whether you're a Democrat or Republican or whatever, Libertarian, whatever, m most people tend to be kind of sympathetic to their local sheriff. So if, if you humiliate him or, or engage in a campaign against him, you're going to get the whole people against you. So in a case like this, you'd be amazed with what these sheriffs can get away with. In fact, just this year, this is my last point, but I'm, so, I'm very interested in this. I can't stop myself. I have the great privilege of speaking to a group called the Constitutional Sheriffs and Peace Officers Association. And we had, in almost no time flat, it was a very short notice, this event, we had about 130 sheriffs from around the country show up for this event, where, among other things, I told them about nullification, and then we honored and gave awards to sheriffs that had indeed followed through with this. Uh, there is a, an increasing interest in this, and if the, if the local people are insistent that something is not going to be done, well, you know what? There's an outside chance they might actually win. We, uh, unfortunately, in Alaska, don't have the privilege of having sheriffs. 
which is it's odd, but we have uh, only state police and local city cops. Mm. Which is what could you give us a little idea if if you can on things like the National Defense Authorization Act? I know there's I've seen on the Tenth Amendment Center that there's several different states that are nullifying that. I believe that's what their goal is in their own state legislatures. How does that work? And can it is it gonna work? Is it something that should be gone after? It's something that we've asked our local legislators quite a bit. Would you please enact a bill going the political route there? But would you please protect your citizens of your state against this federal government, against this military now that can come in and arrest and detain you for whatever reason? Well, this I find this to be very interesting because at first I thought the only people who were interested in the NDAA and who were worried about it were the Ron Paul people and maybe a few scattered voices on the left, and that was it. And then I spoke, I do a lot of speaking, I was at an event in Iowa in January where it was a uh, an older audience, not the typical Ron Paul demographic, and everybody in that room was concerned about this law. It didn't matter where they stood on the war on terror. Their view was, you know, we're willing to go so far for the war on terror, but at some point, if this country ceases to be America, we're going to jump off that bandwagon. And they were concerned about this. So I'm glad to see that there is this movement. Now, there's, there's a variety of initiatives across the state. There are some states that want to go so far, or that the proposal before their legislature goes so far as to say, if a federal official comes into our state trying to enforce this act, uh, we're going to throw him in jail. But there are the ones that are more likely to pass, and indeed the one that did pass in Virginia, is, is basically a non-cooperation bill, saying that you know, federal law enforcement does it, 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 at times rely on state law enforcement for cooperation, information sharing, logistics, facilities, whatever. And basically what they're saying is no state employee will be allowed to, co- to cooperate in the execution of this section of this particular law in Virginia. It will just simply not be allowed to happen. So it's not going to be a case where law enforcement is going to be required to go out there and, you know, lie down in front of the oncoming, you know, uh, uh, federal law enforcement vehicles or something, but it's simply that when they're asked to lend a hand, they're just not going to do it. And, and I, I think that you, you can get away with this, and this, this is how the Fugitive Slave Act in the 19th century was evaded by northern states, but also the more this sort of thing gets out to the public, and as one state after another after another indicates its unwillingness to cooperate. And even these local level, sometimes city or town level resolutions that we're seeing coming out of some of the states are passed. It, I think it has a cumulative effect, and it, it, uh, it has a demoralizing effect on those who would enforce this, and I think it just increasingly makes it more and more difficult for them to do it. I mean, in 2005, we had something called the Real ID Act, which was opposed by both cons- fiscal conservatives and civil libertarians and some others, and when two dozen states basically said, well, we're just not doing this, it, it just fell to the ground. And I, it was the attorney general under Obama who said the reason the Real ID Act failed is that the states refused to cooperate with it. So, you know, hey, that's, uh, that should put a smile on anyone's face. It does. It does. <laughs> oh, and let me point out, on this NDAA thing specifically, I also did a page on this and a video on this, like six-minute video just explaining what's going on in the country on this. And that's at tomwoods.com slash NDAA. So I just do this constantly. I make videos, and then so that the video doesn't go on for three hours, I, I link people to a page with all the resources they could ever want and probably more. And we have a link to your website on our website also. Thank you. Hey, uh, Dr. Woods, I've got a question. I had a caller text in this question. She said in one of your recent uh, talks you addressed the concept of economic harmony, and uh, you suggested ways to change things outside of the political system. Is that something you can touch on here? Uh, yeah, I mean, so in other words, he means uh, um, there are things we can do other than write letters to our congressmen and run for office, that sort of thing? Right. Yeah, I mean, I, my view is I don't want to be dogmatic on what other people should do. If other people feel like they're called to run for political office, I'm not going to tell them they shouldn't. And I think, for me, the main value in running for political office is, frankly, because it, it gives a platform to spread the ideas of freedom. It's not so much because I think one congressman will will turn the tide. Maybe he will. It's not you know, metaphysically impossible. But mainly I support it for the educational side of things. And also because I feel like if we don't, if people like us don't run for office, then, then people will just forget that our point of view even exists because they're not going to hear it debated by anybody. 
they won't even know we're around. I'd like them to know we're around. But at the same time, I understand those who just feel like it's a it's a crooked game. It's rotten. It's uh, you know the Republicans in this sense are no better than the Democrats, and uh, you know I just can't be a part of this. It's just a lot of wheeling and dealing and influence peddling and special interests and all that, and I just don't want to be a part of it. And I can understand that too. So what I've kind of suggested is that there are other things that we can do that you can still carry on the fight in a way that doesn't involve politics. This is the the last chapter of Rollback, my book from 2011, is a list of strategies. What can you do? Some of them are political, but others of them involve, uh, well, number one, education. Like, I don't have very many talents. The only thing I'm good at is I can write books. That's it. Like, I'm not, I'm not good at anything else. I'm not a good organizer. I'm not a good strategist. I don't know how to fix my plumbing. My car, I mean, I don't even know. How, as far as I know, angels make the car go. I don't know any of this stuff. <laughs> the only thing I'm good at is writing books. So that's what I do, because I feel like whatever strategy we're going to adopt for freedom, I know one thing it will have to involve, and that's education. It will have to involve an informed public. So I know that's my role, is helping to bring that about. But there are other things that other, that other people can do, um, to either to educate or to spread the word. Uh, and there are either, you know, there's even a, the most anti-political strategy that I know of, is the strategy developed by this guy Sam Konkin called agorism, which to make a long story very short, his view is that politics is so immoral, it, it, of its very nature it involves the initiation of force against innocent people, either in the form of taxation or whatever, regulatory burdens. It, it's immoral and cannot be morally redeemed, so the best approach is to retreat from it altogether, try to carve out the best uh, situation for yourself possible where you where you interact with the state as little as possible you evade its regulations as cleverly as you can and you basically try to encourage other people to do the same so that the system dies from a million cuts well okay that's that's some people's calling um, but there in other words there's a variety of different things that we can all do and some of them are more important than politics I mean when I look at the current presidential race I think to myself somebody like Rick Santorum who has fooled a lot of people I mean, he is your he is your classic, typical politician, you know, who who gives pretty speeches about his deep moral principles, but who has a, a crummy voting record. He's just part of the machine. I mean, this is so obvious to me. I can't believe anybody's taken in by this guy. In five years, nobody's even going to remember him. He's not going to be. He won't even be a footnote in the history books. And yet, he may win an awful lot of delegates. He may be very influential in that sense. But then, on the other hand, you have Ron Paul, and there are a lot of people who don't like him. Oh, I don't like his foreign policy. Well, all right, but he, unlike all the rest of these bozos, he predicted the financial crisis to a T, knows exactly why it happened, knows the mechanisms for it, understands the Federal Reserve. He's, you know, he's got a, the best record ever on taxes. He's, I mean, just look at all, all, these, all these various things that he's done. He's, he's going to cut a trillion dollars out of the budget. He's an unusual sort of guy. He doesn't brag about himself. He, not only does he not pander, he anti-panders. He goes to Florida and says, let's open trade with Cuba. Like, I don't <laughs> care if you agree with him or not. That takes guts. Yeah. I mean, it's about, you know, wouldn't you rather have somebody like that? So the point is, even if he doesn't win, his influence in shaping men's minds is far, far greater, far greater than that of Rick Santorum. I mean, people follow Ron Paul. They want to read Ludwig von Mises, the great economist. They want to read Murray Rothbard, the great economist. They want to read Frederick Bastiat, the great economist and political theorist. They want to read John Locke. They want to read... I mean, who, who, puts, who says to himself, gosh, you know, my life has been changed forever because of the philosophy of Mitt Romney? <laughs> right? I mean, that doesn't matter. Mitt Romney may become the nominee. His influence will be nothing. Yeah. But, because what matters is changing the minds of men. And that doesn't require votes, and it doesn't require any of the political apparatus. It, it requires persuasion. And that's what this unlikeliest of men, 76 years old, has managed to do with all these young people. He's got them reading books that uh, you know, their parents might have not even known existed or may have been begging with them to, to read, and now they're doing it. That matters, and that was done oh, from a political perch. It's true, which is why I think there is still a, some value in it. But not using traditional political means. He doesn't pander. He doesn't say things just to get votes. He says things that he knows are going to lose him votes, and he just keeps on saying them because he, he knows this is how you reach honest people who don't want to hear just the typical lies and the phony stuff, who, uh, the double talk. And, it, you know, who's, who's to dispute it with him? Because he, here he is at the University of Illinois getting 5,000 people yeah. to show up at his rally. 
you know, uh, Gingrich struggles to get 100 people. Uh, Santorum gets like 150 people. But you'll so, see yeah, the major you know, news they, they, cover they, both they, of those they, events. These guys, it's true. But the fact that thousands come to hear Ron means he's touched them. He's changed them. They think differently. They don't just say, let's cut taxes and bring back the American entrepreneurial spirit and blah, blah, blah. They know it's much, much deeper than that. And uh, I never thought I'd live to, to see the day in our country where so many people would be interested in things that I thought were dorky. <laughs> but now people realize, you know what? There's nothing boring about economics. The fact that I'm getting screwed is actually quite interesting. <laughs> Well, that's that's certainly true in my case. I would have probably never been reading, you know, the Austrian theory of the business cycle if I hadn't heard of Ron Paul. So it's a good point. Yeah. All right, Tom. All right, for an action point today, I, I know it's kind of putting you on on the spot here. In in addition to sending people to your website today, uh, TomWoods.com, what is something that the average person here in Fairbanks, Alaska, can do to not give more power to the federal government? What is something that we can do right now today? I mean, is there a uh, is there a law that we can go out and not comply with? I mean, what what can we do to show our displeasure with what's going on and actually also try to make a change or a difference? Well, I mean, there are th- there are things individuals can do, and there are things that individuals, you know, binding together as groups can do uh, that where there is strength in numbers. But starting with the individual, well, I mean, the most important thing, frankly, is to emancipate your mind from the, the mind-numbing propaganda that you're fed every day. That, uh, I mean, in fact, this is why I'm, I don't mean to constantly refer to this stuff, but when I wrote Rollback last year, I wrote it because I, I, uh, I'm, I was tired of, frankly, what I had been taught for years, which is that, well, you know, I may not like the federal government because of the taxes that it imposes on me, but good heavens, where would I be without it? Well, I'd, I probably would be earning 10 cents an hour, as the terrible robber barons of the private sector enslave me in a coal mine somewhere, and I'd probably be getting my limbs blown off by exploding uh, computer monitors, and my food would all be poisoned, and <laughs> there'd be no science because without government funding, there, that couldn't exist. There'd be no art, and we'd all just fall into a pit. I mean, we, we've all been propagandized to believe this. And once you can emancipate yourself from that and realize that basically everything I just said is not true, and it's demonstrably not true, and which is what rollback is about, explain, showing this, that uh, yeah, eventually we're going to have to cut back the federal government because the budget is too high, but we shouldn't regret this or feel sorry about it. This is going to be a great opportunity to regain freedom and see that in a free society all these things will be better than they are under the direction of government. So the first thing is to, is to have confidence in yourself and your neighbors and realize that you know, if you and your neighbors can't solve your problems together, no government's going to solve them for you. Like We can figure out whatever it is, We'll figure out a solution. That was what Europeans used to be envious and, uh, in fact, confused when they looked at America. When Alexis de Tocqueville came to visit the U.S. in the 19th century, he said, the funny thing is that here in the U.S., whenever something needs to get done, people form a voluntary association and they do it. He said, whereas in the old world, well, the, you know, the government would have corralled you into doing it. Well, here I, f- I feel like we're adopting that old world thing. The very thing that made Europeans interested in us is slipping away. So let's get that back would be the, the, the first thing. Is just refuse to bl- assume they're lying. Now, they, they, they tell the truth once in a while. Like if you ask Obama what his favorite color is, he'll probably tell it to you. But then the second thing would be uh, find groups. You know, it, may, it could be your Tea Party group. It could be a Tenth Amendment Center chapter uh, who are going to stand up and do something. And they'll give you marching orders. Here's the law that is particularly onerous in this state, and we're going to organize against it. If there isn't a Tenth Amendment Center chapter in Alaska, then start one. All right, Tom, uh-huh. thanks very much. Once again, your website, TomWoods.com. That's right. All Thank right. you thanks very much. Thanks very much sir. for the call appreciate in. It. We appreciate it. Gentlemen, okay, we yeah. are at the end of the show. Once again, uh, contact information for Patriots Lament off the top of your head. Oh, uh, www.patriotslament.blogspot.com, and our email is patriotslament at gmail.com. And there's also a channel on YouTube, which is, uh, if you look Radio up on YouTube. Radio Free Fairbanks is our YouTube channel, and uh, we have a link to Mr. Wood's uh, website on ours. And we'll probably post a few of the things that he has on there, put links on our website, so you can go right to it. Wonderful. Thanks very much, gentlemen, for being here. This has been Patriots Lament. I'm Steve Floyd, and I will be back in about an hour for coverage today of the GCI Open North American Championship Sled Dog Races. Coming up right now. We've got an hour of live local talk with uh, Health Talk coming your way. And uh, we are going to continue streaming live at KFAR660.com. Make sure you tell your friends that they can listen to the dog 
races right there on the radio in about an hour. And we'll see you next week with another edition of Patriots Lament. Patriots Lament.